Hey everyone, it's me, Jen Glantz. I am here to read to you one of my favorite chapters of my brand new book, Finally the Bride. As you've probably heard, I am writing this book in real time as I am living out this story of not only being engaged, but just reflecting on all of the past relationships that I've experienced or I've witnessed as a professional bridesmaid. The added twist to this book is that for the past couple of months, millions of strangers have been voting on all of my wedding decisions, and their decisions have influenced not only what my plans are, but a lot of how this book is formed and written and my experiences. This is a chapter that is really emotional for me to read. It was really emotional for me to write. It's called Sometimes It Doesn't Happen, and it is about that feeling you get where you just really think you are never going to find love or a partner or any kind of match. But the interesting thing that happened to me is that I truly believed it. And in the first part of the book, it's about my life right before I met Adam. And during that time, I was positive that I would be single for the rest of my life. Not only was I positive, but I went to see a psychic on Valentine's Day. And that psychic sat me down and told me, Jen, you are never, ever, ever going to find love which was interesting because when a psych tells you that, you really do believe it and it can feel devastating. And I wrote about that in the chapter right before this chapter in the book. But not only that, my views and opinions were constantly bending and changing because I had worked so many weddings as a professional bridesmaid and I had seen a lot on the job and a lot of it wasn't positive and happy. And like the magic you see in the movies, a lot of it was real and ooey and just sort of really hard to digest. I saw people not getting married for love. I saw people having cold feet and calling it off. And I wondered, what about me? How's this gonna look for me? I had been so influenced by all of that I saw, plus this advice from the psychic, and I just figured that maybe I would just never find love. And I know there's so many of you right now who might be feeling that or you have felt that in the past. And I'm not gonna give you dating advice on how to go meet that person, but I am gonna say you that I lived through that deeply. And this is a chapter all about what it means to feel like that. And it's something that I'm really eager to share with you. I'm also nervous to share with you because it's a very vulnerable chapter inside of this book. So I'm gonna go ahead and read this chapter. If you're interested in the book and you want access to it, new chapters are released every single month on the 15th of the month. There's about nine chapters out currently right now and you can get access to it for just 10 bucks on finallythebride.com slash shop. If you want to support this book, I would really appreciate it. I'm writing it in the most unique way, publishing it myself, releasing it chapter by chapter. It is by far, out of all three of my books, it is the book that I open up the most. I am the most vulnerable, and I think it'll make you laugh, but it will also make you feel a ton of things. Whether you're single, engaged, or just a human being who wants to read a book, you don't have to be any of the above to read this book and get a lot out of it. So let's dive right into this chapter. It is called, Sometimes It Doesn't Happen. The first wedding I remember going to was at a restaurant overlooking the World Trade Center a year before it collapsed. My dad dragged me to the window in the corner of the room with the best view, the one right behind the chuppah, and tilted me sideways. Jenny, look, he said, and there close by were two of the biggest towers I had ever seen in my life. They looked like they belonged so high up in the sky, like they were part of this universe, like they were meant to exist. I remember wishing I felt the same about myself. But at 11, with thick braces that could scratch a cheek worse than a cat's claw, and a training bra that protected boobs the shape of birthday hats, I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere, especially at this fancy wedding where the guests looked like they couldn't breathe in their zipped up, dry clean only outfits that were visibly two sizes too small. Everything I knew about weddings I learned from 90s rom-coms featuring Julia Roberts. Sometimes there's a nasty love triangle featuring the groom's best friend and sometimes the bride has second thoughts and leaves the ceremony before saying I do on a giant stallion. I was hoping this wedding would prove all of that wrong. But 10 minutes after the ceremony was supposed to start, the rabbi stood in front of the room of peevish guests, tapping his toes and eyeing his Rolex. You know, the man started to say next to me, loosening his bow tie and taking out a tissue to blow his nose. Sometimes these things don't happen. In the distance, platters of appetizers, cheese and crackers and buffet chasing dishes with closed lids sat eagerly, ready to be served any minute. You mean the food? My stomach giggled nervously. No. 
he leaned in, sliding his chair closer to mine. Sometimes the bride doesn't show up to the party or... I didn't want him to know how naive I was. I was trying to pass for 13 because people took 13-year-olds more seriously than 11-year-olds. 11 11-year-olds. 11 You're a teen. Act like it, they'd say when I'd lie about my age. And I like that because it taught me things other 11-year-olds didn't know yet. Like you can't eat with your fingers in public and people will be offended when you roll your eyes at them. I didn't want the stranger to know that I was an amateur wedding guest that the only way I'd ever celebrated anyone's holy matrimony was through a TV screen while I sucked on strings of licorice in pajamas on the couch. I went to a wedding where the bride never showed up, he said. Wait, like Julia Roberts? Huh? He scrambled. Kid, she didn't come. She stuck a fork in the relationship. We later, we later found her crashing in their honeymoon plane tickets for a month's stay in Tahiti. Whoa. Real life was exactly like those Hollywood blockbusters. I knew it. I heard she ended up marrying the wedding photographer, John, he said. John? Yeah, you would never have guessed it was John. For a while after that, every time I met someone named John, I gave him the side eye and wondered if he was the one who ruined everything. Years later, stuck in traffic in the middle of Times Square, I admit to a coworker that I think I'm dating the wrong person. How do you know? She asks, honking the horn at a stopped car in front of us. When he brings up marriages, mortgages, babies, my skin breaks out into hives in the shape of many X's. Stepping on the gas, she wrestles with the pockets of air in her throat. I can tell she has an opinion, but she's not certain she wants to let it out. I once married the wrong person, she confesses, a one-up brag she clearly doesn't use often. Did you know at the wedding? I remember walking down the aisle, looking at crying guests, thinking to myself, this is gonna have to suck to do again. I sat in the passenger seat with my mouth buckled shut, thinking about how many steps down the aisle it would take for me to feel the same way about the guy I am spending my weekends with. My estimate, three. She says to me that she was texting another guy in the bathroom right before the ceremony started. Was his name John, I think to myself. She says she didn't want to let people down. She went through with the wedding and stayed married for a year. Do you feel bad about it, I asked. My biggest regret was not walking down the aisle, she says, throwing up her hands in the air and saying, sorry, people, sometimes it doesn't happen like you all thought it would. Sometimes it doesn't happen. I say those words to a bride when they hire me to tell me the truth. As their professional bridesmaid, they ask me things they are embarrassed to ask their friends, like, is it okay to have second thoughts? And is cold feet a real thing? You know, they tell me things too. Five minutes into my first session with a bride named Cynthia, she gets right to the point. Jen, anyone ever call the whole thing off? She chews on her lips and picks at her cuticles. It's more than obvious that something is wrong. It's the middle of winter and she's sweating through her blouse like she just left a sauna. I nod my head and she deflates, like somebody poked her with a needle, letting out stale air that's been keeping her sitting up straight with a tacky smile. Oh, thank God, she says. I didn't hire you to be my bridesmaid. I hired you to help me end my wedding. Sometimes it doesn't happen. This is the line I repeat in my head like a trance-induced mantra as I sting with panic, towering over a bride named Rose who minutes ago grabbed me by the wrist, pulled me into a room, and locked the door. Jen, she cries out, I hate the groom. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Okay, I respond, my heart beating so fast it sounds like crickets attacked my voice. The wedding was supposed to start 10 minutes ago. 150 guests are seated and the bridal party is lined up and the song people will walk down the aisle to is queued up with a DJ who won't stop asking when he can press play. Did you um, realize this right now? That's not how it works, Jen, she yelled back like I'm some sort of professional. And then I remember I am. 
I'm supposed to be good at this wedding chaos thing. But even after working over 50 weddings a year for years straight, moments like this completely unravel all of my qualifications. I guess, yes, maybe, who cares? I just don't wanna get married, she says. I think back to the guy in the bow tie, the coworker behind the steering wheel, to Julia Roberts on the horse. People are going to do what they want to do. You can't always stop them. That's not your job. Perhaps in situations like these, your only job is to help them live out their getaway plan or point them to the nearest exit. You don't have to get married. I wrap my arms around her, blowing out her invisible smoke signals. I'll call us an Uber, we'll go get pizza. She moves away from me and sits on the couch, tossing her head back in a beautiful white dress with pearls along the seams. She exhales what feels like a year's worth of stress. Then it all hits me, the other side of the story. I think about the people who are left pacing back and forth on their wedding day, wondering if the person they're supposed to marry is stuck in traffic, went to the wrong venue, rode off on a stallion without sending them the memo. What about their story? What about how it all ends for them? If I let her sneak out the window, my karma will go to shit. What if I never find the person who will make me eager to sprint down the aisle and marry them? Or worse, I find someone I love dearly only for them to pull a Cynthia on me. Maybe our lives aren't anything like the movies. Maybe the real difference is we can control who we hurt and how we hurt them. I look at her and tell her, we'll go. But first, you and the groom have to talk. I step out of the bridal suite and stick the groom inside of it, locking the door and setting a timer on my phone for 10 minutes. When the beeping goes off, whatever they decide, I will help them carry out, but at least it won't be a surprise. Jen, what are you thinking? Ashley, a bridesmaid, storms down the hall, waving her whittling bouquet in the air. They have to go through with this. Shit show, the best man squeaks, twisting off the cap of a flask and downing the liquid inside with just one gulp. My eyes roll at them one by one. Sometimes it doesn't happen. When the timer goes off, I enter the room. So? We aren't in love, Rose says. I flutter my lips. But we are going to go through with it. Fake it for our guest, the groom chimes in. The DJ plays the song and we walk down the aisle. The bride lasts with tears bouncing out of her eyelids. When it comes time to say I do, it's as if the universe begs them to not. Right as Rose opens her mouth to read her vows, a summer rainstorm hits down so hard it breaks the white tent we're all underneath and water gushes in. If this were a movie, the sound effects would drown out the guests screaming. But in real life, 150 people yell so loud and scatter in different directions, no one actually hears if Rose says I do, just spending a life together till death do them apart with the groom. I stay standing next to Rose, our dress is turning soggy, and I watch her eyes and lips curl upward as if the rain was her secret backup plan all along. Hours later, I make my secret exit, skipping goodbyes and hailing a taxi to take me back to my real life where I'm not hired to pretend to be someone's best friend or in this case, partner in crime for a day when all of a sudden, the best man grabs my arm. Dude, Jen, you saved this wedding. His hug brings up a sudden feeling of nausea that I've been swallowing ever since this morning. Let me tell you something, I say, pushing him away. Friendship isn't forcing other people to do what you want them to do. Sometimes it doesn't happen because it's not supposed to. This is real life and these are human beings. Yeah, but today it did, he burps up some whiskey pats me on the butt and walks back into a flooded wedding party where the currents are drifting the bride and groom further and further apart. Days later, I call it off. I have cold feet, I tell the guy who gives me hives, but we're not getting married. Yeah, but one day we will, and I mean this in the best way I can mean it. I just don't wanna have heavy feet walking down the aisle. Minutes later, he's gone. 
there won't ever be an engagement photo of us in the shredder and a completed wedding, wedding registry of gifts we'd have to return and guests fighting with airlines about non-refundable plane tickets they no longer have a use for. Our story ends before anyone else has a chance to get involved. Years later, I see on Instagram he's married with a kid, and I wonder if he thought about me on his wedding day, if he asked his wife to be if she had cold feet, if he told her about a girl who just wasn't sure she'd make it down the aisle or not. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but then again, sometimes it does. That chapter is tough for me to read because I feel all of those emotions coming up again and again and again. You know, people always ask me about these crazy wedding stories and I recall them with a smile and a laugh, but there is so much more that I have held on to from all of these experiences. And that wedding in particular is a tough one to recall in detail because it was painful to experience. It's painful to watch. You know, I am a bridesmaid for hire, but these are real people I work with. And these are people with emotions and feelings and just a heartbeat. And I have to respect that. And sometimes when you're there in these situations, it gets really, really hard and uncomfortable. Thank you for listening to this chapter. I hope that you enjoyed it. And if you did, support this book, grab a copy of it, finallythebride.com slash shop. Get access to the chapters. A new one drops every single month. What a fun, cool way to read a book. Thank you for listening and thank you for supporting me.